Hello, everybody. Welcome to our CME conference for Wednesday, April 13th, 2022. Please remember to fill out an evaluation form, especially if you would like to request CME credit. Today's lecture is entitled Women and Heart Disease, an Underdiagnosed Problem. Our faculty name and affiliation is Dr. Andrea Sendoyan. He is the Assistant Professor of Medicine, Division of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Keck School of Medicine of USC. Today's CME lecture is not supported by any commercial interest. As part of the commercial guidelines, we are required to disclose if speakers have any affiliations or financial arrangements with any corporate organization relating to the presentation. Dr. Hindoyan has nothing to disclose, and with that, I turn it over to Dr. Hindoyan. Perfect. Well, thank you for that warm introduction, Donald, and we are going to get started. And so we're going to talk about women and heart disease and how it um, how it is a unique problem um, in women as compared to the general population. And I hope uh, by the end of this lecture that you'll be identify some unique characteristics um, that make heart disease, how it presents in women different than in other populations. You'll be able to identify specific testing and things that you could do to help your female patients and um, just have an overall better understanding of what a pervasive problem this is. So the um, rates of coronary artery disease in uh, females um, is, is quite significant. So um, if you look at uh, the mortality trends um, in males and females, this is uh, cardiovascular deaths in males, and males tend to have more events earlier on. And um, females uh, tend to have it um, a decade later. And the reason, um, some of the reasons being is that some of the uh, hormonal changes um, that go on prior to menopause are thought to be cardioprotective. And that's the reason why um, the rates of coronary artery disease um, and mortality um, tend to be um, tend to be uh, different. But um, if you look at uh, deaths in the thousands, because men tend to die earlier, it starts tapering off. But it's a linear trend after um, in the mid 80s for females. It's a constant, um, just like uh, some of the worst medical conditions, it is something that is prevalent and something that needs to be thought of as females um, get older in life. So just some alarming facts to talk about uh, in these population. Um, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in women in the United States. Um, it affects one out of every four um, mortalities in females. Um, Two thirds of women who die of coronary artery disease have had no prior warning signs. They had no symptoms. They weren't even attuned to the fact that they might have heart disease. And only 54% of women recognize heart disease is the leading cause of death in women. So this is a this is something that us uh, clinicians need to work at because. Um, you only have a little bit more than half of the population aware that this is this is the number one killer in women, and um, it needs it needs significant attention. So let's talk. Let's delve into uh, some more facts. So, just to put that in perspective, heart disease kills more women than all the cancers combined um, in the female population. Uh, one woman dies every 80 seconds from heart disease. Just process that for a second and think about um, how crazy that is. So in this hour long talk, 
you're going to have, unfortunately, several women who succumb to coronary artery disease and heart disease in general. So if you combine heart disease and stroke, so cardiovascular and cerebrovascular deaths claim over 400,000 lives each year. So, <clears throat> so we talked about, so that, so one death every uh, 80 seconds equates to over a thousand deaths a day. And that equates to um, approximately 400,000 deaths a year. Um, we're going to delve into this a little bit more as we get further on into symptoms, but um, half of women having heart attacks present with none of the typical symptoms that males do. And unfortunately, in a lot of the textbooks, they describe the symptoms as, um, as males would present with more males than, than females, obviously. So we'll talk about the atypical features. Um, in terms of just the physiology, women's hearts are two thirds the size of men's. Their coronaries tend to be smaller um, than their male uh, uh, counterparts. And then 64% uh, of women who die suddenly of coronary artery artery disease showed no prior symptoms, like we talked about, um, that they're unaware and uh, clinicians haven't talked to these patients or screened these patients um, and we don't do a very good job. So that is something that we need to be um, more in tune to and really focus on in order to uh, help stem uh, these numbers and hopefully prevent some of these mortalities. So it's important uh, for awareness. The um, American Heart Association, for example, um, has the um, has the Go Red for Women campaign. It's just like the uh, the breast cancer uh, campaign with the uh, pink ribbons. They have the red dress uh, for women in cardiovascular disease. It's um, it's important to participate in um, in these programs and really um, read their literature to get a better perspective and to uh, help tune your practice um, to be better um, better in tune to screen and really uh, remedy some of the problems that are prevalent that um, hinders. Um, the care and really enlighten the uh, lay population as to how significant of a problem this is. So what is cardiovascular disease? So most people uh, um, think of cardiovascular disease as coronary artery disease. And uh, that includes acute coronary syndromes, which are heart attacks, and then stable coronary artery disease, which, which um, causes angina and chest pain. Under this category, uh, especially in females, in young females, in um, females in their third trimester of pregnancy, there is, um, they could have coronary um, dissections. Uh, dissections can happen in males, but the prevalence is higher in females than it is in males. And that is something that's unique. Imagine um, a female who's about to deliver and the hormonal changes causes cause uh, changes in the lining and the strength of the artery. And all of a sudden, um, they have crushing chest pain they have ST elevations, and they've developed a coronary dissection. Dealing with that is very unique, and it offers different challenges as opposed to patients who present with heart attacks and stable coronary artery disease. Valvular heart disease, again, um, all four valves um, can be affected um, in patients with valvular heart disease, arrhythmias, Again, uh, atrial fibrillation as the population gets older, supraventricular tachycardia. Again, 
more prevalent in young, healthy females as opposed to males. However, it happens in both sexes. Again, ventricular tachycardia happens due to a number of different reasons. Uh, cardiomyopathies um, can, uh, can also occur um, in both sexes. So, what are some of the things um, that we need to um, talk about, and this this is not specific to um, to females, but it's it's important to talk about because this is how we counsel anybody in terms of reducing um, their risk factors. So the first thing is um, modifying sugar intake and preventing and controlling diabetes. Uh, it is important. Diabetes is um, is a known risk factor for coronary artery disease, and um, it leads to more diffuse disease and um, leads to uh, more complications in patients who have coronary artery disease. Um, again, hypertension is is a um, is a big problem. And again, it's a risk factor for coronary artery disease. Uh, hyperlipidemia, as we all know, uh, when it comes to uh, thyroid function, uh, it is something that we should monitor. Uh, when it comes to some of the other cardiovascular uh, heart diseases, such as arrhythmias, again, if you're hyperthyroid, you're more at risk uh, to be in tacky or fast uh, arrhythmias. Chronic kidney disease, patients who are on dialysis tend to have, tend to die of uh, cardiovascular events as opposed to uh, problems with uh, dialysis or end stage renal disease. Smoking, again, there's enough literature to tell us that smoking is terrible for your health and can lead to uh, significant um, cardiovascular disease. As we um, age, again, like the graph said, as we get older, um, the rates of cardiovascular disease go up. Coronary artery disease is not a problem for um, young people. It tends to happen in middle age and older adults. So um, again, some nuances in females is that, um, that up until menopause, um, the estrogen and progesterone that's produced is cardioprotective when it comes to the coronary arteries. And however, once menopause stops or you're a severe diabetic with dyslipidemia and a smoker, then, then those protective effects um, are mitigated. So it's, um, there is an advantage, but it's not, it's not foolproof and there are things that if you don't take care of them, um, negate that uh, protective uh, effect. Um, obesity uh, leads to some of these things that lead to coronary artery disease. That's why it's important to maintain a lean body weight. Uh, patients' um, genetics also play a, um, a part with atherosclerosis. And um, those, are, those are some of the uh, major things that we need to consider. But as you can see, even with all this, um, there's a nuance when it comes to uh, females as it does uh, to the male population. So let's talk about symptoms. And like I alluded to um, at the beginning of this talk, that uh, symptoms tend to be um, different in females than in males. So the classic symptoms are a pressure-like chest pain that radiates to the jaw, goes down the left arm. It could be brought on by exertion, or if you're having a heart attack, it could occur at rest. Uh, but women tend to experience more subtler symptoms. They, they might not have the chest pain. Their anginal equivalent, if you will, will present in a different way, which we'll talk about. And so it's important to, um, 
to keep this in mind. Women also tend to present later because um, they they feel like they have other responsibilities that they need to take care of before they take care of themselves. So how can they present? They could present with, well, all of a sudden I am extremely fatigued. Again, this is a very non-specific symptom. However, in the right context, you should be thinking about coronary disease in these patients. Some people have jaw pain or neck tightness uh, with exertion. Some have dyspnea on exertion. Some have a backache which goes uh, to the mid scapula. And then some have nausea and um, digestive issues. So, Again, just another point to say that, look, the care that women receive compared to their male counterparts is not the same. Um, so when people present because of their symptoms not being the quote unquote classic symptoms, more than half of women are, um, are probably given the wrong diagnosis after a heart, heart attack. And then uh, women are less likely to receive CPR, um, decreasing their odds of survival. And um, and given given the disparage, disparities in care between men and women, women are more likely to die um, in the year following a heart attack than men are. So we need to pay attention to these symptoms. And if there is a possibility that the chest pain that our female patients are experiencing is coming uh, from a cardiac source, it needs to be uh, taken seriously. And we need to assess the likelihood at, of having um, obstructive coronary artery disease. And we need to put these people into a low, intermediate, or high category. And the way we do that is by taking a history, and doing a physical on these patients. People who have a number of risk factors um, and who are having um, symptoms consistent with angina and, and it's pretty straightforward are in the high category. People who ha ha don't have a lot of risk factors, they're having this fake chest pain that does not sound typical are not at no risk, they're at low risk. And then people where, who have some risk factors, who have some symptoms, but it's equivocal, they're in this intermediate range. So we're gonna talk about what you do with members in each population. So in the intermediate risk group, um, most important thing in every group is to modify the, um, risk factors that can be modified. Obviously, you can alter somebody's sugar, blood pressure, cholesterol, um, advise them to stop smoking, um, continue with a good habit with good diet and exercise. That is all really important. Um, and that should be done for all uh, populations. However, in the intermediate risk group, you wanna further classify them as to low risk or high risk. How do you do that? by testing, uh, by doing a stress test, by doing a non-invasive test. And there are three types of tests. There's an exercise treadmill, exercise or pharmacologic test with dobutamine and doing an echo in addition. You can exercise or do a pharmacological nuclear study, which you see here. So with exercise treadmill testing, you're looking at the EKG and looking for ischemic changes, which are uh, downsloping or horizontal ST depressions in these patients. And, um, and in women, more than men, you tend to have a lot more false positives. That's why adding imaging to your uh, stress test um, helps significantly. So if you do a exercise echocardiogram and you see EKG changes plus wall motion abnormalities on the echo, which you didn't see at rest, that increases the probability that yes, this patient likely has obstructive coronary artery disease. 
the same holds true for the pharmacologic nuclear studies. So, like I said, um, with exercise versus a pharmacologic stress test, um, there is a difference. And it, it's not because of the type of test, but it just speaks to the type of patient and their risk profile, right? There's a, there might be a really good reason why this patient can't exercise, like they've broken their legs. But if they're able to walk, they just can't exercise like somebody else, it shows that their, their morbidity is overall is higher and um, that they probably tend to have more risk factors than, than we could assess on a piece of paper. And that was uh, proven here in this um, study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2002. And you see uh, the exercise duration predicts mortality. So um, in patients who do uh, quantiles of exercise capacity, uh, depending on if you do a minimal amount versus a significant amount, if you underwent um, in cardiovascular, um, people who had cardiovascular disease versus normal disease, obviously people who had uh, coronary artery disease tend to have a higher um, risk of death. Um, and if you look at the next slide, where you compare um, risk factors, the more exercise you did, the better off you were your uh, relative uh, risk of death was lower in these patients as opposed to higher when you can exercise as much. So, uh, so just a just a quick question. Um, with exercise, um, exercising versus a pharmacologic stress test. Um, patients who exercise, regardless if they have coronary disease, they have a normal stress test versus an abnormal stress test, you see that um, that cardiac death and myocardial infarction is lower in patients who exercise. Um, who exercise with disease and without disease versus patients who don't exercise, who don't have disease. Look, if you compare a pharmacologically normal stress test, they don't have disease, but uh, they don't, they can exercise on the stress test. Their mortality is higher than somebody who had no disease, but was able to exercise. The same goes true for patients with disease who were unable to exercise. And then um, the high risk patient, um, again, risk factor modification, and you probably need to go to some sort of imaging um, to prove it, especially if they're having typical symptoms. Uh, I just had a patient who took straight to the angiogram suite because he was having uh, typical symptoms. He was taking nitroglycerin with relief. He was found to have a 99% lesion that we fixed in his his pain went away. He was a high risk patient. He was having typical features that had a number of risk factors. He had had a heart attack and therefore it was important for him to go uh, straight to the coronary angiogram so that we could definitively uh, provide treatment as well as make the diagnosis. So what are some of the uh, therapies that we use for uh, coronary artery disease? Um, aspirin, antianginals to prevent chest pain, which include beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, long acting nitrates, which tend to give a headache. So you have to be careful with that. Renolazine, statin therapy, additional blood pressure control, ACE inhibitors in diabetics and short acting nitroglycerin for further relief. So let's briefly touch upon some of the risk factors and, um, and what, what does it mean to optimize these patients. So with hypertension, blood pressure control is a marathon. Lifestyle modification 
is a first line therapy that works and should be implemented initially. Um, overzealous control can lead to negative outcomes such as syncope and, and passing out. Uh, diabetics, chronic kidney disease, not diabetics without chronic kidney disease, um, these people um, have, have issues. The gold bl blood pressure um, should be less than 120 over 80. And um, even without diabetes or chronic kidney disease, the, um, the current guidelines recommend that we should have tighter blood pressure control. Um, diabetics, um, ideally, we'd like our hemoglobin A1C goal to be less than seven. Um, again, same with hypertension, but strict control could lead to hypoglycemia. Weight loss, physical activity are also very important to maintaining a good blood sugar control. Uh, when it comes to uh, cholesterol, lifestyle modification is complementary to any drug therapy. Uh, LDL is the bad cholesterol and is the target for pharmacologic treatment. However, in recent years, we've come up with better medications to treat things like triglycerides, which in certain populations, such as um, our Hispanic population, um, can lead to um, coronary artery disease. Um, again, with individuals who are uh, 40 to 75, we'd like the LDL goal. Um, I'm sorry, this is incorrect. We'd like the LDL, um, the LDL to be around 110, not 190. Please, this is an error. And individuals with uh, coronary artery disease, the LDL uh, goal should be 70, and statins are the first line of treatment, not only to reduce cholesterol, but also for their uh, anti-inflammatory effects. So if you look at um, look at these, um, these curves when it comes to uh, what treatment is best, remember that females tend to have smaller coronaries, um, but when it comes to uh, medical therapy versus PCI in patients with a stable coronary artery disease, and this ex excludes some of the things like left main coronary artery disease, which definitely needs revascularization, and there's a clear benefit to it. But if you look here, in stable coronary artery disease, putting a stent in versus medical therapy did not um, did not. Uh, improve the rate of um, future myocardial infarction. In terms of survival from having another heart attack, again, medical therapy versus PCI did not prevent that. Um, the overall survival was um, not statistically significant in terms of patients with stenting versus medical therapy. And then um, survival free of um, death from any cause and myocardial infarction, again, with medical therapy and PCI, there was no significant difference. And this is, this is uh, true for both men and women. So let's talk about diet. Following, following a diet um, rich in uh, fruits and vegetables and uh, low in salt, and low in uh, processed sugar is probably uh, the best diet to follow. Um, there's, we all need to maintain a healthy weight and do all that um, in females versus males. Um, and so, so I think um, I think it's important to um, to continue. With, um, with a healthy lifestyle. And that does include uh, exercise, which we'll talk about, but diet uh, plays a key role. Um, some of my friends at the gym say that abs are made in the kitchen, not in the gym. And it's true, heart health is also uh, made in the kitchen. Um, and so it's important to uh, maintain a healthy diet. So 
what does the American Heart Association recommend for uh, physical activity? Um, so you want to be active and uh, doing at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity for at least five days per week. Uh, and so that that comes out to about 150 minutes. Um, or you want to do um, 25 minutes of vigorous aerobic activity for um, three days, so a total of 75 minutes. And then uh, moderate to high intensity uh, muscle strengthening activity for at least two days uh, per week in addition um, to, to the aerobic exercise that you should be doing. So we spent quite a bit of time on um, coronary artery disease and how it affects the heart and how it is unique in females versus males. Now let's talk about certain arrhythmias and how they have unique characteristics when it comes to the female population. Let's talk about the most common arrhythmia in, in adults over the age of 75. That's atrial fibrillation. And why, why do we care so much about atrial fibrillation? Yes, it's an uncomfortable arrhythmia. However, it also puts you at risk for a stroke. And um, the way the stroke happens is that because the blood is not moving in a laminar fashion, you have clots that form in the left atrial appendage and they could break off and go and cause an obstruction in the cerebral vasculature, which results in a stroke. And that's why we have therapies which include anticoagulation with originally with, was with Coumadin and now we have oral anticoagulants. And we also have procedures such as the Watchman procedure that is a device that goes and closes up the left atrial appendage. And once it's covered by the heart's own cells, you could get off these blood thinners and only take aspirin and have the prevention um, that you would with oral anticoagulants. So, um, so why is atrial fibrillation um, different in women than in men? Well. There's a chad vas scoring system, which you get a point for risk factors that you might have, um, which include heart failure, hypertension, age, diabetes, history of stroke, uh, vascular issues. However, um, sex also plays a part in this too. If you're a female, you automatically get a point as opposed to male counterparts. So you could tell that um, women are at higher risk for a stroke in uh, when they have atrial fibrillation as opposed to their male counterparts. Um, let's talk about valvular heart disease. And um, with aortic stenosis, there isn't really much of a gender difference. Um, however, when you come to um, mitral stenosis, then, um, then there is an issue that, um, that does happen. I've, I've seen more patients with rheumatic heart disease who, who develop mitral stenosis who are females than they are males. And, and so um, I don't know why that is. I don't have a good explanation, but um, the patients who have mitral stenosis uh, due to rheumatic heart disease tend to be more female than male. When it comes to um, cardiomyopathies, um, again, there are some cardiomyopathies that affect men uh, just as much as women. However, um, there's one in particular that I would like to talk about, which is peripartum cardiomyopathy. So in the last trimester and in the uh, first three months after pregnancy, just like we talked about the hormonal changes, which could lead to um, coronary dissections, 
um, you can develop a um, cardiomyopathy, which is a dilatation of the uh, of the heart muscle because of the hormonal changes. The exact mechanism is still unclear. You have one of the world's experts in um, in peripartum cardiomyopathy at USC in Yuri Alkayem. And so with peripartum cardiomyopathy, you um, it tends to happen in uh, in African American females in uh, females of older uh, birthing age um, who have other comorbidities, and this is a pretty significant diagnosis. Yes, um, a lot of females do recover on good medical therapy. Um, however, uh, risk factor is uh, is having another child or getting pregnant again. So if they were planning on it, it's a very hard thing to break to the family that um, that probably getting pregnant should not be advised because you could have a worsening episode of peripartum cardiomyopathy. And that is another clear example of heart disease, which occurs in females um, versus males. So with that, I'd like to say, look, these are the uh, most important women uh, currently in my life. That's uh, on my left, that's my sister, and that's my mom, and, and, uh, and heart disease uh, has been very prevalent in both in males and females in my family. And um, I've seen the um, some of the things I've talked about firsthand. I've lived it. I've seen it. And so um, there definitely is a difference. It is something that um, that we should draw more attention to. That we should think about some of these unique uh, diagnoses and have um, have a discussion uh, tailored to our patient and their risk factor uh, profile and keeping in mind that um, it is a discussion that is rarely ha had with our female patients. So we are coming towards the end of the hour. Um, I would usually uh, reserve this space for questions, but I know that this is a uh, recorded talk. So um, if there are questions, you could email it to me. It's my first name dot my last name at med.usc.edu. And I would be happy to answer uh, any questions you might have. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and uh, look forward to um, coming to one of my favorite hospitals and giving a lecture um, in person very soon. You guys have a great day. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Hindoyan. I'd like to thank him for his time. Just a reminder to fill out an evaluation form to receive CME credit. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day.